In Luke chapter 18, it says, The one who is entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And tonight, I, I'm using that as my uh, life statement and quote because that's how I feel about international business and my opportunity in the ISM program. Hi, my name is Alex Potiers. I'm a senior at Frisco High School, and tonight I'm going to be t talking to you about my international business studies for the past two years. So just a little bit about me. Like I said, I'm a senior at Frisco High. Um, I'm involved in the drum line and also in DECA. Uh, I like to describe myself as har hardworking and outgoing, and I plan on attending the Ohio State University in the fall. Um, so why do I want to do international business? I want to be in international business because I think that it's a way to see the world, and it's something that's in high demand right now. Um, and I don't just want to sell something one day that's going to like have no meaning on life. I want to sell something that's going to have an impact and make the world a better place to live. I'm also interested in meeting new and diverse people because I'm really interested in different cultures and different ideologies from around the world. Um, and I like challenges that I can that I, you know I can work hard at and overcome. And I just love the whole global aspect of it. So a career outlook in international business, it's going to take about four or five years to get um, an undergraduate in international business and an additional two years for a master's. Uh, to be in international business, you need to be flexible because everyone's really busy once they get a job. And even just in life in general, even in high school, we're all super busy. And if we can't be flexible with each other, then business deals aren't going to get done. People aren't going to want to work with you because if you think it's all about you all the time, they don't want to deal with that. They, no one wants to deal with the cocky American who thinks that they're the best you know, country out there or they're better than everyone else and that their way is the right way. Sometimes other people's way is better than ours and we need to realize that. And obviously, of course, you have to have people skills because without people skills, people aren't going to want to talk to you or trust you or do business with you. Um, there is a neat, increased need for uh, understanding of the global marketplace and international business because as we get new technology and we get closer and closer together, we need people that know how to deal with business trans transactions over, over borders because uh, the U.S. business, about 95% of it is international. Think about that. 95% of all the business we do here in the United States is, is all interna is international. Um, the job is in very high demand. Um, I've had people come up to me that I've talked to at uh, certain like meetings or seminars saying you're doing a great profession because we need people like you. We need people that know how to handle international business situations and what to do. So an outlook on the global economy um, and that over the next 10 years advanced economies are supposed to grow which includes developed countries such as ourselves, the United States, uh, most of the European countries and Japan. However, um, developing countries such as China, Brazil, and India are going to shrink over the next 10 years because they've been kind of in catch-up mode to, to get up with the, the developed countries, and now that they've kind of caught us and they're about on uh, even, even playing field, they're going to start slowing down because there's no need to grow as fast as they would. And because of that, that's going to bring down the economy over the next 10 years in terms of growth. Um, so I had the fortune last year of interviewing five very intelligent and very gifted people, uh, including Lawrence Howarth, who is my mentor today. Um, thank you for coming t tonight, Lawrence. And uh, he, he is president and founder of Howarth International, and what he does is he um, helps other con companies in, in all around the world become international businesses. Uh, my second meeting was with James Dorn, who is a stock trader, and that was a little bit um, off topic, however, for the, those of you that are doing ISM next year here in the room, I would encourage you to maybe try to like go outside the box of your topic of study a little bit just because you never know if you might find something better than what you're doing right now, even if you love what you're doing right now. It's just really great to expand your horizons and learn about a whole bunch of different stuff. I mean, you've been really gifted, as I have been, to be in this program and to be ashamed to waste it because you were being too conservative or not wanting to ex ex uh, try something new. Next, I interviewed uh, Cesar Velasco, who is the Senior Director of Market International Marketing for FC Dallas. Rachel Bilney, um, she was a business director at, for the Texas Luncheons, and MJ Pritchard, she is a v VP of the Frisco Chamber of Commerce, uh, the international side. And so some of the things I've learned in these interviews, I learned so much that if I put them all on slides, we'd be here until graduation. However, the, the most important ones I learned is that humility, flexibility, and versatility are 
vital to success because, like I said earlier, everyone's super busy. If you can't adjust to other people and your clients and your business partners, no one's going to want to work with you. Um, everyone is affected by everywhere in the world. And you might think, for example, like what's going on in Ukraine right now with all that mess and what's going on in the Middle East doesn't affect business here. It does. Because even if it's not a direct effect, maybe it's, say, for the Ukraine, since Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, sanctions were put on Russia and that crippled EU trade, which hurt our trade with them. Uh, so it, it huge domino effect. The world is really uh, interestingly like inter intertwined with each other in terms of economics, and that's what's part of the reason why I want to do international business because I'm really interested in that. Um, knowledge is power. You can never learn too much. Uh, my mentor Lawrence actually says all the time that he learns more from me than I do from him. Now I strongly disagree with that, but it just goes to show you how you can learn from anywhere, even someone who of less knowledge than you, or even that's younger than you. Uh, your life is what you make of it. Like I said about uh, Mr. Dorn, kind of being out out of the box a little bit. If if you want to play it safe and don't want to take any risks, your your life's going to be kind of static. I mean, it'll be a safe, you know, nice life, but it's not going to be one that's extremely satisfying and fulfilling. But if you want to go put your heart and soul into something make the most of your time here on this earth, then you're going to have a fantastic life and you're going to live life to the fullest. You also want to make and use connections because a lot of the times today it's not what you know, it's who you know. And like I said, knowledge is power. The more people you know, the more you can learn from or if you're ever in a tough spot, that can help you out. You also need to be able to deal with n no and having an open mind because you'll be told nine times, no, nine times out of ten in business because that's just how it is. You have to cold call people, you have to find out if there's interest in the product and a lot of times it's a no. And you also have to have the humility to accept the fact that someone might have a better idea than you. So if you're just closed-minded and stuck in the fact that, okay, my idea is the best, this is the best, it's probably not because there's so many, I mean, we're, there's so many gifted people around you, especially in this, in this room, um, and I'm sure at colleges and in, in your career, there's a lot of smart people in this world. It's not, you're not the only one, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of smart people. So if you can't have an open mind to their ideas, then you're, gonna, you're holding yourself back. I also um, did some research uh, through research assessments, which is online articles that we found on, say, Business Weekly that I had to uh, take lessons from. And a few of those are Taking risks and thinking outside the box, box often pays off. Um, this LVHM is a uh, like fashion design, fashion design company, and they open a store in Mongolia. Now, who? That's pretty big risk considering Mongolia isn't a Western uh, Western civilization. They don't really place to focus on uh, fashion like we do over here, and so that was a huge risk for them to go over there and try to start start up a store. However, it worked and it worked really well. Uh, so that kind of out-of-the-box thinking is what pays off. You also uh, want, to, want to prioritize your time because, like I said, we're all super busy and you need to find out what to do first and who, who needs to be your priority. And usually you need to put others ahead of yourself because that, that's how things get done. For example, um, a, a bad example of this is uh, Mr. Obama when we were dealing with uh, the TPP, which is the Trans-Pacific uh, Pact, which is a business deal, a free trade between ourselves and other um, Pacific, Asian uh, countries in the Pacific, such as South Korea, the Philippines, v Vietnam, so on and so forth. Um, however, the time of this meeting was during the time when the government shut down. So Obama decided it would be best to stay here and work out these problems instead of going to this meeting. And so he sent the uh, Secretary of State the other members of the TPP were really highly offended at this because they didn't think that they were important enough to receive the President of the United States and so they felt like they were kind of being like, okay, yeah, like whatever, like we'll, we'll go to this but we don't really care about, about you and that really offended the people there. And while obviously the government shutdown was something important, um, if he would have put others in before ourselves, that we, you know, maybe we'd be farther on in this deal than we are right now, it's, we're just still struggling. Uh, valuable lessons from others' mistakes. Um, I've had the fortune of being the youngest of four kids, uh, my sister and two uh, two step siblings, 
And I've been able to learn a lot from their mistakes. I'm always looking for, you know, what they're doing wrong, not maybe not what they're doing wrong, per se, but things that they've messed up on or just uh, other like events in their life that haven't gone as well planned, or haven't gone very well for them. And that's really helped me a lot in my growth and making my life a lot easier because I've been able to see, okay, that's not right, so maybe I'll try this. Okay, well, that's not right either, so I'll try this. And just that, that um, analysis of like other people and of your own like problems and situations, that's how you grow and learn and make yourself the best possible person you can be. Improvements, like I said, can always be made. Um, you never stop learning. And you can learn from anywhere. And calculated risk and smart investing are essential to success. Now, like I said er uh, earlier, you have to take risk to really be successful and, and truly enjoy life, no matter what you're doing. However, you can't just go at it without having any knowledge of, uh, of the situation at hand. You can't, like, you need to think things through and really be smart about it. Now, don't be too, like, so, like, don't think it through so much that you're always on the safe side, but at the same time, don't, don't not think it through to the point to where you're just being reckless. So my mentor, like I said, is uh, Lawrence Howarth, president and founder of Howarth International. And he is, aside from being president and founder of Howarth International, he is also the head of the uh, Frisco IBC, which is the International Business Council. And he is a officer on the North Texas D District Export Council. So he's had a lot of experience and a lot of different uh, aspects of international business, and he's a fantastic mentor. I've learned so much from him. So like I said, the International Business Council is something I've actually had the pleasure of partaking in. And they're all for growing Frisco, uh, the community of Frisco, and bringing international trade into it. And I was able to see a lot of how like the uh, EB-5 program how that works and what that basically is is it's um, it gives foreigners a green card in exchange for a million dollars of investment here in Frisco and then for example the uh, Cowboys new headquarters you can thank that uh, to international business the new mall we're getting I think it's called called Frisco North Mall I believe uh, in the future you can also thank that for international business investment and that it's just been really cool seeing how much of a, a role international business plays even locally in, in somewhere like Frisco. Now, this is a picture of myself and the IBC last year. So la uh, last year I was able to work with Lawrence and my original work consisted of doing research um, on uh, African black soap and shea butter from Benin which is a country in West Africa, that's the flag up there. And what this helped me with is just uh, the final product all was uh, making a business plan for the side of this uh, company and what I had to do for my original work. Um, so obviously I had to you know, go online and find out like, all the gr good things and bad things about these different products, find out uh, which comp uh, companies are making these products and how they're selling them and find an advantage from that. And the advantage I found was that a lot of these country, uh, companies like L'Oreal and Olay, they have shea butter in their shampoo, but it's like a drop. So they basically say, "Oh yeah, it has shea, you know shea butter in it," but the health effects of these are basically non-existent because there's also so many other like chemicals that actually, for some, can cause cancer. So watch you know watch your shampoo, ladies. Um, we also did a, we made a, a survey which we sent out to which I, I found people to send out to, and what that told us is how much of importance people place on all natural products, on stuff like online shopping, price, and just kind of, we got, kind of got into the consumer's head a little bit and like found out like what makes them tick and what makes them buy uh, certain products. And uh, like I said, the final product was making the whole business plan for that, which included market product and competition, but also uh, financing and how um, I plan to get it from West Africa to, to, uh, to Frisco, Texas. So that was really interesting to see. So this year, um, I'm dealing with the export side of things. Um, last year was more of an import, this year's export. And for those of you that don't know, I'm pretty sure all of you know, but uh, import is when you're bringing products into a country. Exports is when you're bringing them out. Uh, so this year, I'm dealing with wood pellets. And if you would like to pass these around, you, you can. If not, that's okay too. 
Um, wood pellets are a clean form of alternative energy uh, for coal, and you can use them in coal plants. Uh, they burn clean. All the carbon carbon dioxide that was uh, go ahead, yeah, uh, that was part of them um, was already released when the, that tree died. And the cool thing is, you can uh, use leftovers from the lumber industry. Um, there's even like a cleaning process that when you clean the wood pellet. Um, it makes actually more wood pellets. So uh, it's also the cheapest uh, source of clean energy because uh, wood. Uh, I'm sorry, not wood pellets. Wind power is very expensive, and obviously you need a lot of space to put up those giant wind turbines. Solar panels are also very expensive, and um, hydroelectricity requires a dam, which is you know hundreds of millions of dollars potentially, depending on how big it is. So a lot of you are probably wondering, how do you make wood pellets? How does it come from a tree to the things you see in front of you? So what they do is they bring um, lumber from like all, all sorts of, uh, from like leftover from the lumber industry from trees. Um, and what they do with that is they have, let's say, a few like plots of land. And so let's say for the 2013, they'll cut down this uh, plot of land, regrow the trees there. Then they'll go to the next one, 2014, 2015, the next one. 16, 17, 18, and then maybe by 2019, they're back to the first one. And so that all goes right here. Um, it's all gr grinded up and like sh uh, put down to like wood chips. And then it's put into uh, the belt conveyor, which it's then cleaned. And that uh, debris that's, got, that's gathered off it, off it is then used for more wood pellets later. It's then, um, after it's pre-cleaned, it's, it's going to be cut again. It's going to... And then what happens is like it gets like comp uh, compressed with heat into these uh, cylinders, and then like once it's compressed with heat, it gets like cut up, and that's how it gets uh, to the small like inch or two size that it is. Then after that, it's cleaned again, and that material again is that's gleaned from it is put back into production, and then they're going to be put into about 40 pound bags, and then they can be shipped uh, anywhere that you need them to go. So our competition, uh, we have both domestic and international competition for this, these product. The four uh, major uh, production centers in the U.S. Um, are in Maine, which is the Maine Wood Pellet Company, uh, Confluence, which is in uh, West Colorado. It's the biggest um, wood pellet manufacturer in, in the Western United States. Curon, which is in uh, Messina, New York, and Lee, which is in Georgia. And there's a lot more that are proposed or under construction, but these four are the ones that are producing 100,000 or more wood pellets a year that are currently active. For international uh, competition, it's the Russians because they actually do uh, have the biggest wood pellet plant in the world and a lot of, they have about four or five ones that can produce almost 500,000 a year. However, we, they're not considered a problem right now because like I mentioned earlier about the situation in Ukraine, uh, what happened is the Russians were kind of after around after the time of the Olympics ended in 2014, um, they went south of the country and started mobilizing their army. And the Western, uh, the West, including NATO for the most part, basically said, "Do not cross into Ukraine. It's not yours." And they said, "Okay, so we we can't go here." They're like, "Yeah, just don't don't go there." And Russia was basically just like, "What are you gonna do?" And so the Russians were all like, you know, ecstatic that we, you know, we stood up to the the West and the United States, and we got part of Ukraine. But what happened is, we placed embargoes on them, and while they they might not be like worried about that now, they should be because that's really crippling their economy. Um, that's costing them about eight hundred million dollars a year in trade with uh, the European Union, who very big trade partner, and they don't have too many others. So that's really hurting them. And the uh, countries we're selling to are also within this embargo, so they're not comp competition right now. However, someday that embargo will be lifted, and then they will be a problem. Um, another one is Indonesia. Um, their main comp they're the main competition in, in the uh, South Korean market because South Korea has a, uh, a deal with them that Indonesia will set about uh, almost 500,000 acres of land solely for wood pelt production. Um, however, our strengths is that we're going to use deadwood and leftovers from the uh, lumber industry. And the deadwood, why that's important is because in California, for example, 
that's what a lot of the forest fires uh, burn off of, is that dead wood, because it's not helping the ecosystem in any way. It's taking up more space for the living uh, organisms. And like I said, it just, it's just acting as um, fuel for those, those fires. However, the EPA, for some dumb reason, does not want us to take out the dead wood out of those uh, areas uh, because, I guess because they don't want to disturb the environment. However, um, in certain, like in Texas, uh, for example, they, they are allowing us to take out that dead wood. So that can be used um, in a positive way that will also help the ecosystem, help the environment, and help us. Um, like I said, they're, it's extremely efficient. A lot of the times wood pellets make more wood pellets. And our advantage is that we are close to major ports um, such as Houston, New Orleans. Uh, main, the main wood pellet company actually ran out of uh, wood pellets at, for New England uh, in the f uh, winter of 2014, which is a pretty big deal considering it's, that's right in their backyard and they can't even, they don't even have the production uh, capacity to, to supply their own area, let alone internationally. Uh, Lee Energy, for some reason, they use um, a, a lot of their wood pellets for like animal bedding, which I mean, I guess if it makes you money, you know, you do you, but at the same time, that's really, that could be used for so much better um, use for, like, energy. Uh, Kiran only wants to sell within 300 miles of Messina in New York, so they're not a problem, and Confluence is pretty far away from any major ports, uh, shipping-wise. And finally, we also um, are planning on building our plant in Nacogdoches, Texas, which is a, a very forested area, and like I said, very close to Houston, New Orleans. Uh, so some some weaknesses of the other uh, companies is that they don't quite, like I said, capitalize on their energy potential, and they don't have people that really know how to go international because there's a lot of international laws and things you have to be careful about when going international. Um, for example, here if if I were to sell if I were to buy a computer from Harrison online, what I could pay him the money, and if, I, if he gave me the computer and I didn't pay him, he could call the police on me and I would go to jail. However, in international business, it doesn't work like that. If, let's say, I'm going, selling, if I'm buying a computer from Jillian, who lives in uh, the UK, and I buy the computer, but I don't give her the money, she can't just like call you know, the British Army up and say, hey, go arrest this guy. So what we have to do is we have to go through our banks. So how that works is, um, I go, I pay my bank the money, who pays her bank, who pays her. That way, even if I were to buy a product, th my bank is still paying her bank, who pays her, so she'll get her money. Now, the problem is if I don't want to pay for, that, for the laptop, then I owe money to my own bank here in the United States, and that's when I can get in trouble with my own law. So that's why, um, it's, that's part of the reason why it's a, a big, uh, Big deal to have people that can go international in your in your company. So the market for um, wood pellets is the uh, European Union, uh, countries in the European Union, specifically Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, and Romania, and South Korea. And the way I was able to find these four countries is through the trade uh, USA trade online database that I was able to uh, to learn how to use at one of the IBC meetings. And how, what this does is it tracks a certain product and how much the USA exports to these different countries. Um, the reason why I chose the European Union to start out with is because 20% of their energy must come from clean sources by 2020, which is a significant amount of energy. And so what I did is I looked at um, the European Union countries and which ones weren't using, weren't uh, importing any wood pellets from the United States. I was able to get that down to about 12, uh, 10 or 12 cu countries. And from there, I looked at which countries were using coal uh, for their main source, main source of energy, and I found Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, and Romania. Um, and I decided that they would be the best because we can use wood pellets in those uh, companies, in those countries, I'm sorry. Uh, for South Korea, we decided to also search for Japan, China, and, and South Korea just to see what would come up and we found a lot of information about South Korea of how they're really pushing hard for wood pellets. 
And like I said, the forest in uh, Indonesia and Vietnam will not support that hunger for wood pellets for very long. So that was my original work, was uh, doing the research for that. And my final product this year is going to be finding the exact coal plants that uh, will buy our wood pellets, or we can at least pitch them to, and hopefully they'll buy some more down the road. So to first off, uh, we're going to start with Bulgaria, and I'm sorry for these names I'm about to horribly mispronounce, but I'll try my best. Uh, Martista is talk to power station, uh, produces about uh, 1,500 megawatts of energy for that country. Uh, it's about 30% of Bulgarian electricity. Um, it's fairly close to the ports of Athens and Istanbul, which is um, where we can ship from or ship into, and then uh, truck to that uh, p power station. It's the largest en energy complex in southeastern Europe, and if you think of uh, how many countries in southeastern Europe use coal, that's saying something, because a lot of them do. Uh, they have no other supply than coal, so they don't have too many rivers that they can use hydroelectricity, and if they even if they didn't, they certainly don't have the finances for it. They don't have solar panels, and they don't have uh, any natural fossil fuels, so coal is kind of their only thing. And the plant is completely state-owned by the Bulgarian Energy Holding Company. It's the largest, also the largest uh, thermal plant in the Balkans, and in November 2014, the power station was ranked as the industrial facility that is causing the highest damage cost to health and environment in Bulgaria and the entire U European Union by the uh, EEA. And that's, um, that's just one of the more reason why they need our product, because it's hurting their people, it's even killing their people, and it's killing their environment. And my belief on the environment is that we're not just citizens of the United States or whatever country you belong to. We're citizens of the world and we all need to help and take care of our world even if it's not on our borders. The next uh, country we looked into was the Czech Republic and they have a lot of different, um, of different coal plants all owned by the CEZ group who I'll get to in a second. Um, The CEZ group, uh, a lot of plants, and th that's, this is their main power. And as you can see, that they have the 12th dirtiest plant in Europe, and those are pretty also big producers of energy. And those are just the three biggest. That there was about 15 others that produce some uh, different amount of energy. So the CEZ group uh, operates the majority of coal plants in the Czech Republic. They're a conglomerate conglomeration of about nine different uh, companies in the Czech Republic, but they also go into different uh, countries in that area, such as Romania, who I'll get to in a second. But 70% uh, of the energy that they produce comes from fossil fuels. However, they've also tried to experiment with different types of energy, uh, such as like biomass, um, hydroelectricity, wind power, and solar power. And they actually try to use biomass in some of their smaller plants of Hodenin, Porchy, and Tesovia. However, th those are the plants that are only producing about 100 or so megawatts um, per year of energy. And my, in my opinion, I think that they want to use more uh, clean energy. They just don't have the resources um, to produce that energy because the prob most of the forest in, in Europe is in uh, Russia, who, like, as I said earlier, cannot trade with them. So that's going to have to come from us at some point. Uh, the next one is Romania, and the, the big plant there is the Mentia Deva Power Station. Uh, produces almost about 1,300 megawatts of energy per year. It's owned by Termoelectrica, who is, again, a state-owned company of, by Romania. The ash and slag discharged by the plant during one year is about uh, 1 million metric tons, which is a lot. <laughs> um, and that's obviously going to the environment. It's right next to a, a river, so that's all going into that river, which is a main drinking, which is going to go into the Mediterranean, and also that's drinking water, so that's bad. Um, the China Na National Electric Engineering Construction Corporation will conduct several works uh, to re kind of like revamp the plant and modernize it, which is going to be about $271 million, which I find interesting because uh, there are other plants that we'll get to in a second that are also being invested by Chinese com companies. The next one is the uh, Rov Venerari power station, which is planned to expand to about 2,000 a year, which is a ton. 
Um, and that's on the banks of the Jiu River, which again is drinking water and it's polluting that. And that's a lot of the reason why the people there aren't as healthy as other places in Europe. Um, and they're trying to, China again is trying to 